Today, um, I want to introduce what I think is the most powerful and inspirational leadership principle in human history. And every leader that you follow and that you respect follows this principle. And every leader that you follow and don't respect, chances are they don't abide by this principle. Now, you can clearly lead without this principle. In fact, many people do. But I believe that it, without this principle, you will not be a leader worth following. And this extraordinary concept, I think, explains partially why the Jesus movement explodes as quickly as it does and why a first century Jewish cult following a crucified leader with no, uh, with no territory and no military and absolutely no authority not only survived but thrived in the first, second, and third century in spite of the empire's attempt to exterminate it. Now, we're in the middle of this series called Journey with Jesus, and um, we've said that Jesus came into the world to do something completely brand new. It was a radical departure from everything that was in its place before. And one of the things that Jesus comes to do is to turn upside down the way that we practice authority and the way that we exercise power and the way that we lead. And this particularly has implications for religion, but I believe it has implications for every area of life. Now, in the day that Jesus came in, uh, to, or the days that Jesus walked the earth, um, in the first and second century, religious leaders often, now I know this isn't going to sound familiar at all because this is just thousands of years ago, but religious leaders often built upon the very structures of the kingdoms of this world. Instead, they were top down. But the value systems and movement that Jesus began and the values and systems that Jesus launched, this brand new thing, would be an upside down kingdom. It would be an upside down way of leading. Jesus would take the way that people had always led and he would flip it upside down. Now to explore this concept, to explore this principle, I want to begin by looking at um, one of Jesus' most disruptive and controversial miracles. In fact, this is the miracle that honestly ends up getting Jesus killed. This is the one that starts the plotting to take his life. This is the one that has the Pharisees and the religious leaders putting spies throughout Jerusalem. Now, if you grew up in church, chances are you've heard this, this story before, or if you were in Sunday school, or even if you just have some religious knowledge because it's one of the more um, captivating miracles, because it's the time that Jesus raised someone from the dead. He raised a guy by the name of Lazarus from the dead. Now, this was a big deal. Partially, this was a big deal because Lazarus was a really well-known person in his hometown of Bethany, and he was also really well-known in the surrounding community. So when Lazarus died... Like, they sent out a news bulletin to everyone saying, hey, did you hear that Lazarus had died? Oh, I know, what a terrible thing. He was such a great man in our community. Right? It, news had spread, so everybody knew far and wide that Lazarus was dead. And one of the things that's important to know about this, this, this miracle, this, when Jesus raised Lazarus from the dead, is that, that Lazarus was like dead dead. You know, ever so often you hear a story, even today, like they pronounce someone dead and then they are about ready to put them in the casket and then like five minutes later the person starts moving and they're like, oops, our bad, like we misread that one, right? That was not the, that was not the case. He was in the tomb, he'd already been embalmed, they'd, they'd done the things, there was no coming back. This guy was like gone. They were cleaning up the meal after the funeral. It was over, there was nothing left. And then Jesus raises him from the dead. And as you can imagine, it's already shocking enough that someone who was dead and now they're alive. But Lazarus was a really big deal. Everybody knew him. And so all of a sudden, this guy that everyone had heard that had died, all of a sudden now he was alive. That news spreads really fast. And it's a captivating story. It was a big deal. In fact, it became such a big deal, you'll see this in a moment, that, that, they, um, that, that Bethany, the town that he was from, becomes a tourist attraction. I mean, they were like putting the giant billboards up on the highway saying, come see the man who was dead and now he's alive again. Come to Bethany and see Lazarus. I thought that was funny. Nothing. You are a rough crowd tonight. The morning loved that, so I'm just going to say. Um, 
But it also catches the attention of the religious authorities. And so if you have your Bibles, turn with me to John chapter 11, beginning with verse 46. So Jesus has raised Lazarus from the dead. People are impressed. People have begun to follow Jesus in droves. But some of them went to the Pharisees and told them what Jesus had done. Then the chief priests and the Pharisees called a meeting of the Sanhedrin. Now, we, we heard about the Sanhedrin a couple weeks ago when we talked about the story of Nicodemus. Nicodemus was a member of the Sanhedrin. They were the ruling body in Jewish life. They were essentially the Supreme Court, um, probably even more power than the Supreme Court would have. Um, but they were the, they were the arbiters between, uh, between Rome and the people. So Rome worked with them and they worked the people. It went both ways. They're an incredibly powerful group of people. So anyway, all these really key religious leaders get together, and, and essentially they're having an identity crisis because they say, this is them talking to each other. In fact, maybe they're kind of lecturing one another. But they said, what are we accomplishing, they asked. Here is this man performing many signs. Look, what did you do this week? You held a religious service? How many people did you heal? And so they're, they're, they're kind of having this identity crisis. But they were smart enough that they were clued in that this wasn't just simply a random miracle, but the things Jesus was doing was pointing to something brand new, that something new was entering into the present order, that the old was passing away, and that people were going to follow this new thing. And so you get this really um, arrogant statement. They basically say, if we let him go on like this, Everyone will believe in him, and, when the Romans, and then the Romans will come and take away both our temple and our nation. This is a very practical conversation, because Rome had kind of left them in power as the religious leaders of, of the day, but if everyone gravitates to this new thing, they could lose their power, and they could lose their temple, But also, they believed that if they were to lose the temple, they would lose the nation because the temple was central to who they were. They're like, this guy is a threat to who we are. He is a threat to our power. He is a threat to our radical way, or he's a threat to our way of life. Verse 53. So from that day on, they plotted to take his life. Right? This is it. This is the final moment. They know they have to do something about Jesus. They know that he has gone too far and he is too big a threat. He needs to be dealt with. Now, what we read in the text is that Jesus then begins to keep a very low profile. He doesn't go home to Galilee, which would have been the safest thing he could have done. He stays in Judea because he needed to go to Jerusalem soon for the Passover. And so he didn't want to go too far away. But Jesus begins to move stealthily. He begins to try to not draw too much attention to himself. But he also knew that the Passover was just around the corner. And he knew that was the moment, the big moment, when things would begin to go down. John's gospel also tells us, we won't read the the whole text, but John's gospel tells us that the religious leaders then put spies all around Jerusalem at the gates and all the places where people hung out looking for an opportunity to arrest Jesus. Now, they they at times would know where Jesus was, but the, the, the key thing was to find Jesus when no one was around because if the crowds were around, they might riot. Um, and so they were looking for an opportunity to capture Jesus. So Jesus is kind of making his way quietly through the countryside, trying his best to to stay under their radar. And during his wanderings, he goes back to Bethany, where Lazarus was raised from the dead. And once again, a large crowd is drawn. John chapter 12, beginning with verse 9. A large crowd of Jews found out that Jesus was there and came, not only because of him, but also to see Lazarus. See, Lazarus has become a tourist attraction, whom he had raised from the dead. So the chief priests, this is really fascinating, the chief priests made plans to kill Lazarus as well. For on account of him, many of the Jews were going to Jesus and believing in him. 
So they needed to deal with Jesus because he was a threat, but also this dead guy who is now alive running around proclaiming that he was dead, and now, but he's someone named Jesus raised him again. He needs to be dealt with as well because he is a walking billboard, a walking symbol, a walking uh, proof of this new thing that Jesus was up to. Lazarus was evidence that something new had happened. So the text goes on, the next day, the great crowd that had come for the festival, right? Every time there was a festival in Jerusalem, any of the, the seven key religious festivals, um, particularly Passover, um, Jerusalem's population would swell. It was already a large city for its day. It would have a, had about 50,000 residents on any given day. During the religious festivals, they would swell to almost 250,000 people. The next day, the crowd heard The next day, the great crowd that had come for the festival heard that Jesus was on his way to Jerusalem. And so they begin to look for him. Anytime there's someone famous around you, you go and try to see if you can catch a glimpse of the famous person. And so people want to catch a glimpse of Jesus. So the Pharisees said to one another, see, this is getting us nowhere. Look, the whole world has gone after him. Look, there's no chance to find him alone and to capture him. The crowds are flocking to him. These crowds are getting bigger and bigger and bigger. And as they move towards the Passover, we know the events that happen leading up to the Passover. This is what we talk about on Palm Sunday, right? As Jesus moves into the city, the crowds grow larger and larger and larger. And as Jesus makes his way into Jerusalem from Judea, they they begin to proclaim, Hosanna, Hosanna, Lord help us, Lord save us. There's so much tension, there's so much emotion, there's a hunger for the people to be free both from Rome, but also from the oppressive religious powers. There's also all this this fear on the part of the religious leaders that their power is going to be lost. So there's just a ton of tension and a ton of emotion. And added and layered on top of all that is Rome has come into the city with all their might and all of their power, making sure that nothing goes wrong. So Jesus is on his way, headed towards to Jerusalem for this big event, for the Passover. He's on his way to Jerusalem. In Mark chapter 10, we read it this way. They were on their way up to Jerusalem with Jesus leading the way. And then it says, verse 32, again, meaning Jesus has said this before, again he took the twelve aside and he told them what was going to happen to him. He'd already told them the story before. He'd already told them the things that, was, that were about ready to happen. But he had a sense that the disciples didn't quite understand, and you'll see in a minute why he had this sense. So he pulls the disciples over to the side, maybe he gets them off the main road, and they go underneath a sycamore tree, and they kind of hang out in a meadow, or hang out in a field. And Jesus talks to his disciples, because it's once they get to Jerusalem, things get crazy really fast. And he, he, he has a sense that they still don't fully understand what is about to happen. So verse 32, he took the 12 aside and told them what was going to happen to him. He said, we are going up to Jerusalem and the Son of Man will be betrayed to the chief priests and the teachers of the law. They will condemn him to death and will hand him over to the Gentiles. Gentiles will mock, who will mock him and spit on him and flog him and kill him. Three days later, he will rise again or he will rise. Now, this has to be really unsettling to the disciples. But it also doesn't compute because what they know is that Jesus is a big deal and that his crowds are getting bigger by the day. And they know that Rome doesn't really care about him and the Jewish leaders aren't going to touch him when there's so many people following him. They also know that once he gets to Jerusalem and the crowds are getting bigger and bigger by the day, once he gets to Jerusalem, this is his chance to make a move. You get all those people pushed into such a small space, it becomes a real powder keg. And you make the right move, you, you, you make the right strategic decision, and you could make a move on the, 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 both the political and the religious order of the day. And so they are expecting, they know something is up. And so I think they're hoping that Jesus is just setting the expectations low. I think maybe they heard Jesus saying, hey, by the way, just so you know, this could go poorly and I may end up dead. But even if I do, it's okay because I'll come back. But they still couldn't understand that the eventual end of this journey was certain death. 
How do we know this? Or how do we, why do I surmise this? Because, so verse 34, you just need to, this, this blows me away when you read them next to each other. Verse 34, Gentiles will mock him and spit on him, flog him and kill him. And three days later, he will rise. Jesus says these, those exact words to his disciples. Things are gonna go really poorly, dudes. Then, verse 35, Then James and John, the son of Zebedee, came to him and said, Teacher, they said, we want you to do for us whatever we ask. Which, by the way, is a very bold and arrogant claim. It's kind of like when you go to your friend, hey, I need you to promise me something, but I need you to promise that you'll do it before I tell you what the thing is. But Jesus plays along. He says, what do you want me to do for you? And they replied, let one of us sit at your right and the other at your left when you're in your glory. When your kingdom comes, when you are king, when you are crowned, and you are the glorious Messiah over Israel, can we be at your left and right hand? And Jesus is beside, has to be beside himself. He's like, do you not understand? I just told you this is going to end in death. This is not going to end well. No kingdom, no glory. And Jesus replied, you don't know what you're asking. Now, when the other disciples heard, they were indignant. When the the ten heard about this, they became indignant with James and John. I'm guessing people who have the boldness to do this, make this move, have done similar things before. I think everyone's already a little annoyed at James and John. In fact, they're called the sons of thunder, which may give you a glimpse into their personality so Jesus has some upset disciples on his hands and so he calls them together again and says this look you know that those who are regarded as rulers of the Gentile lord it over them and their high officials exercise authority over them I think Jesus was saying look you've seen how Rome rules we, we talk about it all the time when we're on our journeys and when we're sitting around the campfire at night, we complain about how Rome exercises power, how the emperor uses power on his own behalf, how he leverages the poor and the weak to serve him and to serve his needs and his desires. We've talked about how disgusting it is to watch the abuse of power on, from Rome. You know that those who regarded as rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them and how they exercise authority how they leverage their power to their own benefit with little thought to those they rule and then Jesus looks at them in the eye and he says not so with you not so with you Not so in this new kingdom that is coming. I'm introducing something brand new, something completely different, a new way of using resources, a new way of exercising power, a new way of exercising authority and leadership is coming. Power and influence is not to be used for the powerful and the influential, he said. We're flipping the script. Power and influence will now be used on behalf of the least. And then Jesus says, instead, whoever wants to be great among you. I think this is actually really interesting. Jesus does not chastise them for wanting to be great. The problem isn't that they want to be leaders. Or they want to rule. The problem is they don't understand what it looks like to exercise power. And this is actually, I think, an important point for those of us in D.C. because a lot of us are fairly ambitious individuals. And we are just beginning our careers. We're just beginning the trajectory of where we're going to end up. And and many of us are going to achieve great things and significant influence because we're ambitious individuals. It was baked into us from the time, many of us from the time we were born, right? You were the kid, the annoying kid in the front of the class that always had the right answers and always made me feel stupid. Look, I know who you are. I've hung out with you. You're a smart group of people. But the problem that I see with our generation in particular, or millennial generation, your gener- the generation that comprises a large chunk of you, is that 
we, we are distrustful of power and authority. And the problem is, is that then we kind of, we play as if we don't have power and authority and privilege. And when you do that, the truth of the matter is, many of you either do or will someday have power and authority, and we all have privilege. But when you pretend as if you don't because you're distrustful of it, you don't steward it well. And so Jesus is saying, look, Instead, whoever wants to be great among you, right? it is okay to want to lead. It is okay to want to have authority and to exercise power. In fact, one of the things I, 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 that kind of bothers me is often um, organizations that are distrustful of power will often want to have flat leadership structures where everyone has a voice and you make decisions by consens- consensus and you like all sit in a circle and decide. It rarely works. Because ultimately, at the end of the day, even no one, though no one has a, a, a tag on their shirt that says leader, someone in that room is exercising power and authority. It's just not been identified, which often causes chaos. Because people are often looking to see what that one person will say, and when they're on board, everyone else is on board. And so we need to stop playing as if we don't, we don't exercise power or exercise authority or have influence, or have privilege. But instead the question is, how will, you, how will you steward that which has been entrusted to you? Instead, whoever wants to be great among you, and they're like, yeah, that's me, Jesus, they all raise their hand, must be your servant. And at that moment, the air is let out of the room. Because they know what servants do. Some of them have had servants. Their families have had servants. They've seen the roles that servants take in that culture. Servants are about as low as you can possibly be. Servants serve the needs of other people, not their own needs. They wait on people hand and foot. He said, look, instead, whoever wants to become great, you must become a servant. And then he says this. For even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. Jesus was the king who came to reverse the order of things. He would be the king that would lay down his life for his subjects rather than asking his subjects to lay down their life for him. That's how kings work. They ask their people to die on their behalf for a greater good. But Jesus comes and says, no, I am the one who's laying down my life. I am the one divesting myself of wealth and, or of power and of privilege. And we know that the earliest disciples get this because in the early church, one of the problems that they have, we read about this in the book of Acts, is that they had a hard time getting some of the, the leaders, the people who'd hung out with Jesus, they had a hard time getting them to teach because they were so busy serving the least because they had really taken this message of Jesus to heart and so everyone was trying to outserve the other person which is one of the reasons that the Jesus movement spreads as quickly as it does early on because they cared for so many people and and so finally they had to like sit Peter down and say Peter we really appreciate your service but you hung out with Jesus you had a front row seat with Jesus could you maybe impart a little of that knowledge and just chill for a second and stop serving? Somebody else can serve. Can you maybe share with us what you experienced? So the disciples and Jesus, they, they've just come through the parade. People are shouting, Hosanna, Hosanna. It's a big deal. And, and I think one of the things you need to understand is as Jesus is moving through the crowd and people are throwing their, their palm branches down and their cloaks on the road, and the crowds are getting louder and louder and larger, that it's intoxicating. I'm not sure if you've ever maybe been famous or been around someone who was famous, um, but it can be intoxicating. I, I traveled for a while with someone who I, I consider a mid-level, low to mid-level celebrity. In certain worlds, it was a very big, he was a very big deal. And um, everywhere we went, we'd have a car and driver, and people would just flock around him. They'd want his autograph. They'd want to talk to him, get his opinion on things. 
And, and one of the things that you notice when you hang around with people who have power and celebrity and influence is that people often treat them differently than other people. Every joke they tell is the funniest joke in the world. Everything they say is the most interesting thing in the world. And I at times just want to tell them, you're not that funny. You really aren't. But, but no one's going to tell them that you're not that funny because everyone acts as if they're that. It's intoxicating. And those who are in the orbit, you begin to feel that you're special too because you are connected with that person. And so as Jesus and his disciples are moving into Jerusalem for the Passover, they're feeling pretty good about themselves because as they're going in, there are literally thousands of people cheering them on as they make their way into Jerusalem. Their egos have gotten a significant boost because everybody saw that they were with Jesus. And so then they get to the upper room and this, by the way, this, this is the, the, I've probably talked about this moment more than any other moment um, in Jesus' life because I think it's one of the most powerful moments. It is one of the moments that most clearly puts the invisible God on display. So they get to the upper room. They are stoked. They feel the energy from the crowd. This has been a big day. They are connected to this guy that everyone else wants to be near. They are ready to rule. And then Jesus, they get to the upper room, John chapter 13. He took off his outer clothes and wrapped a towel around his waist. And then he began to wash their feet. Peter flips out. He's like, no, 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 Jesus. You shall never wash my feet. And finally, Jesus convinces him to let him wash his feet. And Jesus then proceeds to wash all of their feet. I think we gloss over this moment quickly, but it takes a while to wash someone's feet. There are some churches who do this. It's a little odd, but they do it, right? They'll have like a foot washing ceremony. I was even thinking about it, and I realized I shouldn't have said this because I know someone in the audience is one of these people. But there are people who like have foot washing. I went to this one wedding and they had a foot washing at the wedding. That's just, it was, it was, it was, it was awkward to watch. How about I just put it that way? It was awkward to watch. If that was you, that's very, very special. Um, (laughs) But it's awkward to watch. And you can just imagine as the disciples watch the king of the world, this person that they've invested so much hope and potential in, this ruler, this powerful individual, as he kneels down and begins to wash their feet. And I think in some ways it's a humiliating experience for them. And it takes a while, and he goes from person to person to person. And as they watch as he takes his hands and washes his, their feet, I imagine there have to be thoughts thinking, I know what those hands can do. I've seen those hands raise people from the dead. I've seen those hands heal people. I've seen the marvelous miracles those hands can perform. And here he is washing their feet. And then without saying anything, Jesus put his robe back on. He wiped his hands. He sat down at the table. And then he says these words to them. Verse 13. You call me teacher and Lord, and rightly so, for that is what I am. I, I am a big deal. I am an important and influential person. You're not wrong. But now that I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you should wash one another's feet, because I have set an example that you should do as I have done for you. And then he says, very truly I tell you that no servant is greater than his master, nor is a messenger greater than the one who has sent him. Now that you know these things, you will be blessed if you do them. I think what Jesus knows is in a few years, the people in this room are going to be a big deal because the Jesus movement was going to explode 
And people are going to want to talk with and be with the people who hung out with Jesus. Their star was about ready to rise. They were going to be people of influence and power. And he said, when you think that you were a big deal, when you begin to think you were a big deal, you serve other people. You serve other people. When you start thinking you're a a big shot, find someone's feet to wash. And don't ever forget this night. This is the Jesus' final moments with his disciples. This is the thing he wants them to remember above all else. His final moments he spends not imparting some theological treatise, nothing talking about atonement and what that means and all the other things. No, his final moments he spends a significant amount of time washing their feet. And this becomes central, this idea of servant leadership, of putting other people first. This becomes central to the Jesus movement. Christians throughout the world were known for caring for those who were sick. They would refuse early in the first and second century, they would have refused to abandon villages when the, when the plague would sweep through and almost everyone in the village had died. They would refuse to run because they were not afraid of death and they would nurse people back to health. Christians were known for taking in and abandoned and exposed children and for their compassion and their generosity, not just to the people who were in, but even to the people who were just simply their neighbors and friends. And often at times, even their enemies. In fact, um, there are places still today in our world, there are garbage dumps. Um, there's this whole story, and I can't remember the whole story, but there, there's a garbage dump where the Christians are the ones in there. No one else wants to go in and care for the people who kind of live in this, this slum, this dump. It's the Christians who are in there caring. It all began that night. Now, there are a lot of dark things that the church and Christians have done throughout history. And we have to acknowledge that. We have to be truthful about our past. But also this evening, anywhere in the globe, you can find Christians who are serving other people, who are giving to themselves, people who have divested their power, serving other people. That's our story. That's the story that we're a part of. And we have to be honest about our dark spots and honest about where we went wrong, honest about how we've abused power and privilege and authority, how we've used it for ourselves and not for others. But against all odds, a cult with a crucified leader with no territory and no military and no authority spreads like wildfire in the Roman Empire in spite of their best attempts to stop it. And if you're a Christian, that's your story. But let me get practical as we end this evening. What does this look like? How do we, how do, what does this look like on a daily basis? And I think it really all boils down to a simple question. And I think this is a question that you can ask yourselves tomorrow at the office that you can ask yourself in your friendships, in your relationships, in your family. You can ask yourself this question someday when you're a big deal. Everyone wants to know what you think when you have people reporting to you. And the truth of the matter is, a lot of us are already asking this question now of somebody else who's over us. But the higher we go, and the more influence we have, the less we ask this question. But these two questions I want to leave you with. First, how can I help? How can I help? And then how can I leverage me for you? As a Jesus follower, we should ask this question over and over and over again. How can I leverage what has been entrusted to me? How can I divest what has been entrusted to me on your behalf? Um, we had, and when we started the table, we had an associate pastor, a guy by the name of Caleb Scutt, and he did this, this sermon about ambition. Um, and, and he talked about how many of us 
are ambitious people. We are ambitious for ourselves throughout our lives. We're, we're climbing the ladder. We're, we're trying to go to good schools and get a good education and get, a, get, the promotion, get that promotion at work and all the things that we're doing. And it's particularly important and relevant to, to our crowd in this city. It's full of ambitious people. That's how you ended up here in many cases. But then he ends the sermon this way. He, he says, what would it look like for you to be ambitious for other people, to seek their good, to seek their success. And I think that's what it looks like when we ask this question, how can I leverage me for you? How can I help you be successful? How can I help you thrive? How can I help you live life fully? How can I help you have everything that you need in order to live and to survive and to thrive in our world? And the thing is, not only is this, this Jesus-centered, but it's actually really good practical advice for your future. Because the world is hungry for servant leaders, people who serve humbly. There's been some fascinating studies done by, by leaders who have succeeded. And over and over, they often find that some of the most successful leaders are people who are servant leaders, who constantly ask, how can I help you? How can I serve you? And if you do, you will be like your Father in heaven who looked down on a me-first, self-centered world and said, what can I do to help? And he sent his Son not to serve or not to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom, ransom for many. And he calls us to do the same. Just imagine for a moment what would happen in your friendships, what would happen in your community, in our city, if we begin to embrace this idea? It rocked the world and transformed the world once. And I still believe that this, this principle of servant leadership has such incredible power. And it reveals to us the invisible God. A God who empties himself and serves. Let's pray. God, we thank you for the way that you modeled what it means to empty yourself of, of authority and power. We thank you for the ways that you showed us how we should lead. And I pray that we would be a people who are known for our servant leadership, people who are known for, for leveraging what has been entrusted to us, not for our own self-interest, not for our own wealth or power or authority, but that we are known for leveraging what we have on behalf of others. In Jesus' name.